Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. I'm very honoured and would particularly like to thank the Parity Group in general and the organisers of this event in particular, particularly Irina, Caitlin and Sabina, along with the department as a whole, as the Dean, the Rector, uh, for supporting my visit. I'd like to say right at the very beginning that while I happen to be the body that's here in the room, PALA, the advocacy group that I'm representing here, is a collective. And much of what I will talk about is the work of others. In particular, the, my, the work of my close collaborators, Justine Clark, Jill Mathewson and Susie Ashworth, our graphic designer, Catherine Griffiths, and an ever-widening circle of collaborators and contributors and community. So please don't ascribe sole authorship or credit to me. As we know, such claims in architecture are usually untrue. And in this case, I am very definitely representing the work of others alongside myself let alone the generations of scholars and activists uh, upon whose shoulders we all stand. Now, I also know that Justine has preceded me here, as we've just heard, um, and was a speaker by Skype at one of the parity talks, in fact, the second parity talk here several years ago. So I'm aware that some of you may know something already about the work of Parla. On the other hand, some of you may not. And so what I'm trying to do here is uh, reintroduce the project, but to draw out some different aspects. And it really strikes me that being here at this time, as we've seen this morning, is an enormously exciting time here in the department. Um, I was reading your agenda action plan online uh, and hearing the stories about what's been going on here and thinking that this really is a time of self-reflection, re-evaluation of change and development towards greater equity and diversity. I know it's also been a time of some scandal. Uh, there's been a time of, uh, there's been anger, there's been zeal, there's been boldness, and there's also obviously been unsettlement and even fear. Of course, anyone who doesn't believe that equity and diversity is important is fairly unlikely to be sitting in this room right now. But I wanted to open by recognising that along with self-reflection and development comes negotiation, which is very often uncomfortable, and change, which is almost always resisted. So it's in the process of productively working through this discomfort or even struggle or trouble, let's say, that is of interest to me. Because Parla is above all engaged in working towards change at a cultural level, a process which is slow, challenging, and I would say absolutely necessary. So this talk has four unequal parts. First, a brief reintroduction to the work of par the Parla Collective. Then second, an analysis of some obstacles that I see to the progress of gender equity, including why previous initiatives have struggled in Australia as elsewhere. Third, a look at some resources which outline a pathway to cultural change. And finally, a very brief introduction to some new work we're engaging in now, um, which I hope will be of interest to you. Obviously, it's very aligned to work that's already being done and which perhaps we might even collaborate upon. But I wanted to start, if you'll indulge me for a second, by reflecting briefly on my own journey as an academic, which has paralleled my work in the Parla project, and it, as a certain, type of, uh, a certain type of hybridity that exists in both. The reason, obviously, that I'm here is because of our work as advocates. This image represents us advocating. But for me personally, long before I began investigating gender equity in architecture, my research interest was in museology and museum architecture, and specifically the cultural politics of architecture in contemporary purpose-built social history museums. We see here the National Museum of Australia. And I was especially interested in dealing with those museums which address difficult histories. Oops. Um, later, I developed interest in architectural criticism and the mediation of architecture through the written word, and later still in methodological questions, including this book, Speaking of Buildings, which uh, is a collaboration with Yanina Hosea, uh, now here based at ETH, uh, which will be published by Princeton Architectural Press later this year. Throughout all of this, I've also maintained a practice as an architecture critic and commentator, including, as we see here, as a columnist for Places Journal. So these roles of researcher, writer, and advocate have coexisted, and in fact, they've coexisted quite comfortably uh, and have thoroughly infused one another. Scholarly interest, my initial scholarly interest in cultural politics in museums has remained, but the object of analysis has shifted to take in the cultural pol politics of methodology, of historiography, of public scholarship, and the cultural politics, obviously, of gender equity. <laughs> 
What has changed is the way I now understand the absolutely essential value of quantitative research, and particularly the visualisation of data, as a rhetorical tool and an essential instrument for changing people's minds. And that's the kind of secret topic or subtext of this talk. In recent years, my perspective has also shifted significantly in another way, because now I have a leadership role in an architecture school all of my own. Um, it's one thing to stand on the outside of structures and critique them. It's quite another to work within the complex and constrained environment of a large bureaucracy with multiple staff and multiple sensitivities and bring people along through consensus building and values-based leadership and therefore to build and change a culture. These are my people. So that's what I've been thinking about since at the beginning of last year I became head of the architecture department at Monash University, a school of some 800 students, some 30 staff, which is, and Monash University is a large research intensive institution with a strong emphasis on the hard sciences and medical research. So I've come to think uh, of my recent experience as an academic leader in terms of a kind of autoethnographic action research project. Um, observing myself with interest as I have negotiated becoming a member of what we could call, problematically, the ruling class, and the face and enforcer of institutional regimes that I may not agree with and may have limited capacity to change. I watched myself and wondered with interest, will I become complicit? Will I become institutionalized or more than I already am? Will I become, in the language of the 1970s, the man? All this remains to be seen. I hope not, but we shall see. Now, I don't want to pretend that I'm some kind of wild renegade who's come in from the cold. My own political position, which has been aligned with Parler's position, has always been moderate. Uh, um, diplomatic, conciliatory, even relatively mainstream, it's been both pragmatic and opportunist and tried to make change when it could, as it could. And this continues unchanged for both me and for Parler through a hybrid practice of research, advocacy and accessible communication and engagement in the public domain. So, PALA, Women, Equity, Architecture, which is its full name, is a project that began in 2012 as a communication platform for a research project. Today, it is a formally incorporated advocacy and activist organisation. This is the launch. PALA is both space for building community and a site for exchange. We operate in the space between academia and practice, between scholarly and practice-based knowledge, between research and advocacy and action. We think this is a place of great possibility and opportunity. Parla has its origins uh, in a research project initiated by a large group of scholarly collaborators led by myself. And importantly, oopsie, not working. note here that the original project was funded by the Australian Research Council, Commonwealth Government Research Funding, competitively applied for, of course, but it meant that this project had far more resources than any other project in Australia looking at gender equity had ever had before and the resources are important. Um, it was a large government and, and industry funded project that involved both academics and in industry partners. It aimed to map women's participation in architecture and to understand why women are underrepresented at senior levels in the profession. It sought to identify actual and perceived barriers to progression and to identify and promote strategies for change. The findings will come as absolutely no surprise to you, I'm sure. They mirror earlier findings in Australia as well as elsewhere, certainly in the UK and Canada, and I would strongly suspect that they would parallel findings here in Switzerland. They can be summarised as follows. Women are underrepresented in architecture, particularly at senior levels. The proportion of female graduates is close to parity, but women are not advancing in proportionate numbers. Women architects tend to follow atypical, quote-unquote, career paths, and of course that makes you think, what is a typical career path? And what, um, you know... Why is that seen as typical? Twice as many women are active in architecture as are registered or licensed. Women tend to leave, step sideways, or not return from a career break. This is particularly pronounced in terms of uh, parental leave. And in Australia, we clearly had a problem that someone would go on parental leave and come back to find that their job had evaporated, which in fact is illegal. But leaving that aside was very common. There is strong evidence, irrefutable evidence of gender-based pay inequity, which I'll return to. Architects working part-time are frequently sidelined. And this is the kicker. Long, low pay, long hours, and difficulty in reconciling professional and family life are also problems for men in architecture, but they impact in different, specific, and compounded ways for women. 
So the point is, we're not saying things are great for men and things are terrible for women. That's not the point. The point is that they're bad for everybody on some level, but they are specifically and particularly problematic for women in ways um, that are important to acknowledge. Now, it's worth making an important aside here about our focus on gender. The nature of our original funded project was about women. It was an explicitly feminist project. You will have noticed that all of the researchers were women, not accidental. And it squarely addressed the challenges and structural disadvantages facing women. However, this approach is limited. It's problematic, I would say, to look at gender in isolation from other markers such as race, class, sexuality, age, ability, and so on, which intersect and interact with gender in complex and important ways. Likewise, the very category of woman and the concept of gender as binary is increasingly called into question. And for the record, for the record, our project includes any person who identifies partially or wholly as a woman, including trans and non-binary folk. Furthermore, the project could be seen as dangerously skewed towards a white middle-class cisgendered perspective. And I would say that criticism is justified. It's a problem. It's something that we're working on. But the fact remains, for better or worse, our project has been primarily about women who are part of the profession or community of architecture broadly conceived. Not just practicing architects, but also includes people who've been trained as architecture and who have left, and that is a very important distinction. So as part of the initial research project, Jill Mathewson compiled a comprehensive statistical map. Um, uh, and it's important to note that much of the primary research I'll present here was done by Jill, who was the PhD student uh, embedded in the initial project. As you can see here, by whatever measure is used, women disappear from architecture as you proceed into roles with higher status or which are more senior, influential or powerful. Now, I'll try and explain how to use this, how to read this map. Um, it's not working. Um, but basically, on the... On the Left-hand side are the more junior levels, and you can see that the uh, filled circles represent the proportion of women relative to the proportion of men, which are the single lines. And you can see that those filled circles get smaller and smaller and smaller as you get to the right-hand side, which are the most powerful positions. So on the top line, this is um, staff in all of the universities teaching architecture in Australia, where lecturers are 50% women, but full professors are only 12%. Likewise, amongst students, Women comprise 44% of all students, but as they um, continue to register, which is a mark of engagement with the profession as well as credentialization, only 34% uh, of registered architects are women. Uh, if we think about membership of the Australian Institute of Architects, once again, a, measure, a mark of engagement with the profession, um, the proportion of national presidents who have been women is 4%, quite low. Uh, the proportion of directors of firms is 11%, quite low. Whereas at the other end, you can see that there are very high proportions of women who are not only student members of the institute and graduate members of the institute, but who are employees or sole practitioners rather than owners of um, architectural practices in their own right. And then at the very bottom here, we have um, people who report themselves, report their profession as architect according to the Australian National Census. Um, which is a, you know, interesting and un unimpeachable source of data. And once again, we have um, these figures where 34% of uh, employee architects are women, whereas only 13% uh, of owners of large businesses are women. So anyway, you see the story. It's a very familiar story. Women disappear as you get to the more senior levels of the profession. Now, it's amazing to think that until we started our project, Australia had very little data about the shape of the profession at all almost none, let alone the, the women's participation in it. So establishing a firm evidence base that unequivocally demonstrated the multiple issues was an essential step in understanding the change that was required. Not only do you need the data, but you need to visualize it in a compelling way. These statistics provide important material for analysis and interpretation in terms of identifying barriers, understanding structural mechanisms and developing solutions but they also play an important role in the advocacy and activism component of the project, as I'll return to in a moment. But as the research progressed, the question for us became, what do we do with this material? How do we activate it and use it to generate change? We were very aware that there had been numerous reports into women in Australian architecture over the years, all of which had made excellent recommendations, all of which had been quite specific and quite achievable, most of them not at all radical, 
but very few of them had actually been realised. So these are the reports. 1986, women in the architecture profession. 1991, towards a more egalitarian profession. 2005, a key report, going places, the career progression of women in architecture, and a kind of backlash against that in 2007, the career progression of men in architecture. Um, for, so looking at these reports, which as I say, were expensive, completely credible, important works of scholarship, and thinking, well, they were completely ineffective. Um, looking at these felt both mystifying and dangerous. We did not want all of our hard work to be left to gather dust on some institutional shelf. So the question of why these earlier initiatives had failed to get traction and how we could avoid the same fate became a fascinating issue which we have been pondering and testing for the ensuing seven years. And really, this is the central problematic, indeed a central problematic of our age, how do you use research, knowledge and information, I might dare to say facts, to change people's minds and also their behaviour, and hence to change the norms and structures of their professional lives? This is a question that occupies us and presumably also you to this day. To begin with though, we realised that it was not enough to simply provide the data and the evidence that there was a problem with gender equity. We would also need to set out a roadmap to address it. We had first to define and explain the problem, and then also try and begin to solve it. So we needed to become advocates and activists as well as scholars and researchers. So we launched Parla, the name of which is derived from two origins, the French to speak, and that room in the house where guests are received, hence a space to speak. Parla generated interest quite quickly. Online media enabled us to build a new so-called community of interest, one that crosses geographic boundaries, both within and beyond Australia. In addition to new knowledge networks, this international reach has added significant impetus and credibility to our own campaign back home. The level of interest demonstrates a clear need. Remember that this was starting to happen before many of the other um, worldwide initiatives had really gotten started. So there was clearly a need for this, a strong desire for discussion and an ambitious commitment to change on the part of the architectural community. It also showed the power of new media to connect the many individuals with shared and sometimes unarticulated concerns and experiences who previously had no place for these to be expressed and shared. So it was in that spirit that we developed the Parlour Guides to Equitable Practice. These consolidate the knowledge developed through the research and locate it within broader discussions of workplace change and the so-called business case for gender equity. The guides address 11 topics. Each outlines the issue, why it matters, and what we might do about it. We is divided into three, it addresses multiple audiences, individual employees, employer practices, and institutional and professional bodies. The parlour guides recognise that different parts of the profession have different types of agency and suggest that we all have a proactive, positive part to play in facilitating change. The guides were developed through extensive consultation with the community and an intensive process of drafting and redrafting. They were also very well designed by Catherine Griffiths, our designer, and that is important because just imagine if they'd been ugly. The architectural community would have not taken them seriously at all. So a kind of visual language which um, meets the norms of the profession was obviously very, very important. Now they've been very well received and are now making their way around the world, including recently having been taken up and reinvented by the American Institute of Architects. So um, we did talk to them when they were in the process of developing these and we were ever so slightly surprised that they came up with the same title. So these um, were released by the American Institute of Architects in November last year, they've just been made open access, you can find them on the internet. Uh, and they have started with four, I don't know how many they're going to end up with, but for them, questions of intercultural, uh, racial uh, questions are absolutely central. And I think in that regard, they've really redressed a lack in the original parlor guides. Another of our recent projects is Marion's List, named for uh, Marion Mahani Griffin. This is an online register of women in architecture, which aims to provide a richer picture of women uh, and in architecture in the built environment, not only those who would be notable enough for a Wikipedia entry. And it's also to act as a resource for those organising events, setting up juries and crits, so that we need never again hear the line, we asked a woman, but she couldn't come. So w another significant outcome of the research project was the Australian Institute of Architects' gender equity policy. Now, 
this policy was the most hard fought, the most heralded, the most seemingly significant, and definitely viewed as the most important outcome by the Australian Research Council. However, um, oh, and it does acknowledge the structural issues that result in equi inequitable opportunity for women in Australian architecture. And the fact that we got the Institute to actually admit to that did feel like a very important moment. It sets out an agenda for, for change with 10 principles guiding action. It set up a national, the Institute set up a national committee for gender equity, which has been a standing committee charged with implementing the policy and seemingly with a serious mandate for change and an obligation to monitor and report on progress. But you can tell I'm coming to the but. But this is where we get back into dangerous territory and an insight into the perils of top-down policy. Because despite the fanfare with which it was received, and I must say I feel uh, okay about saying this partly because I'm on the other side of the world, but I can honestly say this has been one of our least effective interventions in terms of creating actual change. So this returns us to the earlier question. What kinds of interventions actually work? And what kinds are well-meaning but ineffective? Or indeed have inadvertent harmful effects? Or are harmful by being ineffective? So reflecting again with the benefit of experience on why these past reports and proposals had limited ef effect, ef efficacy, I can see a number of factors. Importantly, I don't think these are limited to the Australian context, and I think any organisation which is attempting to make change towards greater gender equity and diversity will encounter similar barriers. Importantly, um, they're, also they have some similarities, but also some differences to the situation which condition architecture schools, and I'll return to that. So I think the reasons why those past initiatives didn't work were the belief that equity is a niche or minor or special interest women's issue. The idea that it's too hard, the issue is intractable, nobody knows what to do, it will never be solved. Boredom, this is a pretty significant one actually. Haven't we already looked at this? This is tiresome, we've already addressed this issue. I always think if it's tiresome for men, it's even more tiresome for women. I'm tired of this issue, I can tell you. Progress is slow, early, favors, early failures are demoralizing, and I can tell you now, there will be early failures. It's very important to not be demoralized by them or to not let them make you fail. There is political complexity. There is a risk of defensive and polarized debate. Now that one I'll return to. There can be active resistance. There can be opposition to affirmative action. I don't wanna deny that there are misogynist people in the world who will actually resist on those grounds. Um, there's, there can be, or certainly in the past in Australia, there has been a lack of engagement or commitment from leaders. There have been leaders who have been committed but have lacked the skills to make change at a cultural level. And I don't mean to say that in a judgy way because actually those skills are quite specific and quite difficult. And to learn the arguments that you have to make to argue for gender equity, to get that female professor up over that male professor, even though the female looks very, very different, that is tricky. It's tricky to make those arguments and they, it requires skill and it has to be learned. Advocates become exhausted and step back and when they step back, their projects cease. Advocates can offer, have in the past had a localised effect and the inability to communicate widely and hence to collectivise. There's been a lack of data or there's been a reliance on individual stories which can be discounted as anecdotal, subjective, partial and complainy. There's been a lack of resources, money for research, money for initiatives, and there's been a pervasive restrictive beliefs about what a real architect is and does, including work patterns, which are themselves um, exclusionary. Now, if we think about that, so that's a kind of depressing story, but that's okay, I'm gonna come back to this and, and tell you how we can um, address those things. So this is a kind of interesting four-stage uh, model developed by Amanda Sinclair in terms of the four stages from denial to inclusion of uh, executive culture. Stage one, denial. The absence of women from the culture is not regarded as a problem or core business issue. I think we're probably all old enough to remember that stage. Stage two, women's difference is seen as the problem. Solution is framed as women adapting to the predefined, usually male norms. Stage three, incremental adjustments made to existing structures to incorporate women. And stage four, the organization commits to a new culture the exclusion of women is seen as a symptom of deeper problems requiring solutions that change the existing culture. So, um, it's, I'm arguing that in their past, the Australian architecture profession, acting in and through the Institute of Architects, was at stage one. 
It was at the denial stage. Later, it moved more or less to stage two, blaming the women, although a fairly high number of individuals re still remained at stage one and will always remain at stage one. I think that was the status when the Parler project began. And the point was that the profession had simply not been convinced that there was an issue. They, were, they had heard a few brave and doomed women complaining, but dismissed them as radical, difficult troublemakers who were complaining and asking for special treatment. What the Parler project was able to do was to show the following. Sure enough, there's a pipeline issue. So what this is telling us is that uh, the central circle is the proportion of women graduating relative to the wider circle, which is the proportion of men. So you can see it becomes literally a pipeline by the time you get up to, uh, and the figure in the middle is the age group, okay? So there's a pretty high proportion of uh, architects, female architects in the age group 25 to 29, but by the time you get up to 50 to 54, it's 15%. Okay, so we can clearly see the attrition here. Likewise, when we first started showing this graph, there would often be an audible gasp in the room. It's irrefutable. How could you say there was no problem with gender equity in architecture when you see this graph? This is census data. It's collected by the Commonwealth Government, not by us. It's not biased. Um, it is irrefutable. So women come out bright-eyed and bushy-tailed from their architectural education, and then they gradually leave. Uh, Full-time and part-time work, overwhelmingly dominated by women, very, very few men working part-time, and this has powerful effects not only on wages but also on promotion and the types of roles that one can fulfil. Women are tending not to own their businesses, uh, and a much smaller proportion of women own businesses than men. And the pay gap, this is the other one that makes people gasp, because I want to particularly draw your attention to the one over there on the far left. So this is Australia, and perhaps it's different here, I hope so. But why would there be a 5.2% gender-based pay gap for new graduates? It's, it, it's, it's astounding. It's, it still makes me speechless because they're, they're graduates. It's not like we could justify that based on their experience. We're paying the men more because they've had more experience. They've come out of the same education. So this tells us there is a structural problem. Uh, oh, and this, this is the other one. So this one is quite good because it, um, this makes the men think, oh my God, this situation is really not working for us either. So this is a graph that shows hours worked. And the women are on the uh, left-hand side and the men are on the right-hand side. So the kind of dark, sorry, the pale colour at the top is more than 49 hours per week. You see the proportion of men who are working more than 49 hours per week? The kind of brown colour is 41 to 48 hours. The pink colour is 35 to 40 hours. And below that is 25, uh, less than 34 hours. So you see the culture of overwork is really not serving men. It's not serving women, but it's really not serving men either. Uh, and when you show this to young men in the university context, for example, they're like, oh, you know, what have I got myself in for? Because I would also like to be a father and I would also like to be engaged and I would also have a like to have a life outside of architecture. So coming back to this, um, the set of statistics and others like them, we talked about them calmly and quietly as one reasonable person to another and thus we were able to demonstrate that there are systematic and structural patterns in how women as a group, not as individuals, but as a group, engage with the profession. And in this way, I think, we were finally able to convincingly make the case that yes, there is an issue for women in architecture. This is not a niche or special interest question. It is something that leaders should pay attention to for moral and ethical reasons, which we're all familiar with, but also for the future of the profession and to stem the huge and in fact, frankly, tragic loss of talent and potential that departs the profession as women leave. Furthermore, we tried, and I hope we were successful in showing that addressing problematic working conditions in architecture could also be of significant benefit to men. Now this, you might have seen this, this is a kind of meme, does the rounds on the internet. So I hope that in some way we've been able to shift the conversation. Firstly, away from an oppositional polarized war of women against men. It's clearly not productive, I would argue, for men to feel under siege, since men are a major part, perhaps the major part, of the solution here. Nor does it help for the conversation to be one conditioned by attack and defence, since fear and shaming is not always conducive to productive action. Perhaps fear and shaming has a role to play, but I would say it's not always conducive to productive action. 
I think it was a mistake in the past to not believe individual women's accounts of their own personal experiences of inequity, but it would equally be a mistake to blame all men. In any case, when it's demonstrated that gender patterns exist at the level of a whole architecture population, it's equally a challenge for that whole population to address. I hope in this way, we've changed the conversation in Australia from one about equality, which argues that everyone should be treated the same, to equity and fairness, where everyone has access to the same opportunities, which importantly, sometimes means treating people differently. Now, this is something that can be tough for people to get their head around, but it's not just about uh, being treated exactly the same at the point that you enter, it's about um, uh, ameliorating possible inequitable effects. And I've found that an image like this, which is difficult for fair, reasonable and rational people to refute, and in my experience, most people, not all, but most people are at base reasonable. So, in all of our events, we've tried to cultivate a kind of positive and constructive tone and to locate our material in discussions of the future of the profession. Our symposium, Transform, asked if architecture was more inclusive, would it also be in a stronger position? This, look, look what fun they're having. This was a, a remarkably positive and inspiring event. The room was full of optimism and ambition and a commitment to driving change. So we've really tried to consciously shift the um, discourse from telling war stories. There's a place for war stories. The war stories need to be told. But uh, co positively collaborating for change, I think, means moving on from war stories. Furthermore, we've attempted to address issues of perception and bias head on, to give voice to them, to unpack, unpick them, to challenge them, and to suggest alternatives. So this is a talk that's given by my colleague, Justine Clark. It's a very, very powerful talk on six myths about women in architecture, which debunks them and dismantles them one by one. And this is a talk she gives frequently, not only at individual architecture offices, as well as schools of architecture, but also industry events. And I can tell you, obviously, I've already, we've already talked about how myth one, there is no issue for women in architecture, is indeed a myth. Um, myth two, the, the problem is because of the macho culture of the building site. Nope, the problem lies in architecture. Um, myth three, women don't want the big jobs or women aren't ambitious. Not true. Women are ambitious for the work and for what they can achieve. They might not necessarily be ambitious for personal glory and money, but that doesn't mean they're not ambitious. Uh, myth four, it's because women have children. Also not true. Myth five, you can't be a part-time architect. Not true. Myth six, there's no pay gap in architecture, or if women are paid less, it's because they ask for less. Also not true. Likewise, architecture is a meritocracy. If you're talented and work hard, you will succeed. Unfortunately, not true. And gender is a women's issue. I hope those of us in the room know that that is not true. So um, we've also, but importantly, we've not forgotten the individual experience and have tried very hard to solicit personal stories, to value the anecdotal and subjective as such, as both the counterpart and the human face to the qualitative data, or quantitative data, sorry. Um, giving women the platform to describe their own experiences so that they themselves might reflect and others might learn from them follows the classic feminist strategy of framing the personal as political. And this is one of the parlor salons, a regular sequence of um, series of events around the country. We've also harnessed the possibilities of participatory social media and web 2.0 online community. For instance, through guest hosting of the parlor Instagram account, which much to all of our surprise, has uh, become incredibly popular, including just this morning being listed at, on Metropolis as uh, one of the Instagram accounts to watch. Um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, we've partnered with international collaborators on WikiD, a project to write women into Wikipedia, building on an earlier architects initiative. And incidentally, this is an excellent assignment to have your students do, write women into Wikipedia. Uh, we've curated publications and events around the visual sociology of architecture, which try to diversify the idea of what an architect looks like. That is, an architect might look like a woman, or like a young person, or a person who is not white. This was the subject of our exhibition, Portraits of Practice, at Work in Architecture, which was staged in Sydney in 2015. Now, of course, some issues remain. That is the understatement of the century. Gender equity is genuinely difficult to achieve and it will require all of our collective ingenuity, brilliance, cunning, commitment and skill to shift it working together. 
Those who think it will be easily and quickly solved are wrong and may be liable to disappointment. Also, there are certain people who will remain obstacles. Their biases are so strong and their minds that their minds will not be changed by any amount of showing them the facts. Many such people are in positions of power. Youngsters often assume that this is simply a generational thing and that people with such attitudes will die out like the dinosaurs. Hence, it's simply a matter of patiently waiting. But that kind of thinking, I would argue, is also a mistake, since such thinking is not only manifest in certain people, but also certain beliefs which continue to pervade the profession. So, for example, we see here, um, when we were doing consultation around the parlour guides to equitable practice, we talked to people about what equity issues they thought were most important. Uh, one of the key things to take from this is that all of the issues were rated either important or very important. Um, but what we see here is, um, for most, uh, the highest rated were gender-based pay equity, architectures entrenched long hours culture, and the underrepresentation of women in senior roles in the profession, followed by other things. We also asked people what they thought was most open and least open to change. The things that they thought were most open to change were none of the things I just mentioned. There are issues about career mentors and mentoring, availability of parental leave, which is Commonwealth government law in Australia now. Uh, and the things that they saw as least open to change were long hours culture, availability of part-time work, and underrepresentation of women in senior roles. But things have changed. I think the conversation has changed in the last seven years. The business case has been strongly made. Leaders are being obliged to act, and they are also choosing to act. There are more advocates to share and carry the load. And we've seen the global upswell of advocacy groups in architecture. There are wider social movements, including Me Too. There are more resources as organisations and institutions face internal unrest and external bad press, i.e. they're held accountable. And examples prove that the debate can be constructive, moderate and collaborative. Uh, I think increasing emphasis on research and audit builds data to demonstrate the issues are structural and systematic and Web 2.0 allows us to build community and collectivise globally. Um, so what I didn't say on the previous slide is that the participation and level of engagement of women in Australian architecture has also increased quite markedly. And see here, this, is, this shows us 2001 to 2016. And once again, one of Jill's uh, graphs. And you see at the bottom is 2001, at the top is 2016. Uh, the circles represent the proportion of women um, in engaged. So there are more graduates, it's up from 38% to 44%, but there are also more registered architects. And new admissions to the register of architects have exploded in the last um, six years. Um, the proportion of women as part of all architects has increased, as have employees, as have, as have the owners of small businesses and owners of larger businesses. In Australia at present, there is a woman national president of the Institute of Architects, women chapter presidents in a number of states, a majority of the deans and heads of architecture departments are women. This is really very interesting. It's a really an unprecedented moment. And without being immodest, I think it's fair to say that our research and our advocacy and action has been part of the movement to make this happen. Now I'm just gonna skip this bit quickly because I'm running short of time. But this is one of the resources that I mentioned from the Australian Workplace Gender Equality Agency. It's their Gender Equality Roadmap, and it's a more sophisticated version of the, um, uh, the four stages model that I told you about before. So there's five stages, the avoiding stage, the compliance stage, the programmatic stage, the strategic stage, the integrated stage, and the sustainable stage. Now, this is your moment to think about where your organisation lies. I mean, I'm not necessarily just talking about um, ETH, but you might want to think about that. Um, I think it's really very useful to work out where you are and hence where you can, where you can uh, hope to progress to. And for me, of course, I'm thinking about this in relation to my own school of architecture and wondering where we sit. So the avoiding stage is not dissimilar to the denial stage. There are structural and cultural barriers to female career progression. They're either unrecognised or denied. There's exclusive or discriminatory behaviour towards women and it's accepted and seen as perfectly normal. No measurement or reporting of gender representation or equality issues occurs and no one accepts or sees a need to allocate responsibility or accountability for gender equity and diversity. That's the kind of really base level. The compliant level is interesting because this is where it becomes a kind of box ticking exercise. So gender equality and diversity are seen as a compliance risk 
not an enabler or imperative. Any gender equality or diversity activity is limited to meeting compliance observation, uh, obligations. It's about keeping others off your back, and that's it. Box ticking, keeping them off your back. The programmatic stage is interesting. Gender equality and diversity activity occurs only in response to issues that cannot be ignored. Actions and initiatives are ad hoc, reactive and tactical rather than planned, proactive and strategic. Gender initiatives are disconnected and fragmented, which limits synergies, efficiencies and impact. Organisational priorities take precedence and displace gender equality action if and when necessary. And the failure of gender initiatives to achieve progress or change undermines long-term support. This is where it gets risky, right? People are starting to do something, but it might not be easy and it might not work straight away. The strategic level, a specific case for addressing gender equality is identified and promoted by leaders. The leaders begin to step up. A gender strategy is developed, which links to and supports organisational strategy and objectives. Gender strategy is used to guide effort, investment and specific initiatives. Action plans are developed and implemented. Governance and reporting mechanisms are in place. Level four, the integrated stage. Gender equality best practice is integrated into organisational policies and processes. The case for gender equality is understood and embraced at all organisational levels. Commitment to and investment in gender equality progress is unaffected by other challenges. People hold the line and stay the course. Structural and cultural barriers to female career progression are actively challenged and addressed. And finally, the kind of holy grail is the sustainable, the sta sustainable stage. Leaders hold themselves and their people publicly accountable for gender equality outcomes. Leaders have the necessary capability, confidence and commitment to build gender inclusive cultures. The organisation and its leaders are role models for gender equality and inclusion and influence others. Ongoing commitment to gender equality is unaffected by changes in leadership composition. It's not just about the champion who happens to be at the top. And gender equality is simply part of how business is done and how people work together always. Now, I don't know where you think you are. I think that my um, school of architecture is probably somewhere between three and four, maybe. I think the Australian architecture profession is somewhere between two and three, maybe. Um, but this is kind of useful, right? Because you can get to five. As we've seen this morning, the capacity is clearly here. The will is here. It's about finding the skills, finding the knowledge, and finding the will and the resources to really carry that through. Um, so, in closing, what next? Well, we have grand plans. First, we are turning the research to related disciplines. Justine and Jill have recently been working on demographic data around landscape architects, and we will soon also turn our attention to planners. You might be interested in this. This is a curiosity. Um, people often think that landscape architecture is much more equitable, far more um, parity in terms of men and women, but look, plain pattern, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, for me, one of the most pressing things is the plan to turn our research back on architecture schools themselves. There's long been a narrative that in Australia at least, gender inequity has been much less of an issue in architecture schools than it has been in the profession. After all, we have nearly equal number of female and male students, um, and it's clear that young women in the architecture courses do just as well as the men, they're just as talented, they win awards in equal proportions, they're leaders and equal collaborators. And here the usual narrative is that the university is a pure meritocracy which sends brilliant young women out into an inequitable world. However, it's clear that it's not quite as rosy as that, as that story. As we can see in this recent major study, commissioned by the Australian Human Rights Commission by Universities Australia, which represents the 39 universities in Australia, and which reported shocking levels of sexual harassment and sexual assault in university context, including clear abuses of power and generally, one of the things that found, I found most striking was the generally quite alarming dynamics between PhD students and their supervisors, where there's really a, clearly a, um, a capacity for abuse of power. So I just want to bring you back to the top line, that in itself. So the university, the university staff tells us that there is a problem. So furthermore, we know that there are significant is issues in universities as workplaces, particularly around gender balance among staff, especially at senior levels, as well as continuing problems with all male crit juries and all male public talk panels. Women taking on a disproportionate amount of invisible academic labour in the form of pastoral care and administration, 
implicit bias in student assessment of teaching, implicit bias in um, recruitment and promotion, and so on and so on. And we've heard these stories this morning. It's the same world, the world over. So, um, for this reason, our most recent initiative is a set, what we're planning, is a set of guides to equitable practice for architecture schools, addressing, hopefully, in a constructive and helpful way, practical and specific, what can be done by institutions, individual leaders, staff and students to move towards a more equitable place of work and study, research and teaching. The guides are in very early draft form, and in fact, it might not end up being a guide, a series of guides, it might end up being a charter. I'll have to talk to you about that. Um, but they're likely to include discussions of the need for audit and analytics of staff and student demographics, equitable selection and promotion of staff, recruitment planning and working towards a balanced staff, including finding and mentoring women into positions of power, student culture and the agency of students, curriculum, including expanding practice and diversifying the canon, as we heard last night, and constructive classroom practices, particularly around the crit. The guides, as I said, are in very early draft form, but we would be delighted to work with any international partners, including ETH, on their development. So in closing, I want to leave you with three ideas, which I would call facts or truisms, and which have guided me throughout this talk and indeed throughout all of my practice, including in my present role as a strange kind of hybrid, a researcher, writer, advocate, and academic leader. They are. The people who design the built environment should be as diverse as those who use it. If you believe that, we have some way to go to make that happen. If you accept that talent is evenly distributed and that it doesn't only come from advantage of any kind, then you must actively look for it in all its varied forms, all the varied forms that it takes, which will, will look different from the norm. Excellence itself comes in diverse forms. I was delighted to hear your rector saying that this morning. Finally, if you don't take steps to actively include and recognise and promote women and minorities, then the system will exclude them. Doing nothing will lead to inequitable outcomes. Thank you very much.